along with that ties into obviously you need to have goals you need to be willing to learn everything but you need to be a learning machine if you it doesn't matter what you want to do if you're working somewhere in an office or you know whatever it is in order to advance in your career you're going to need to learn new things if you want to be an entrepreneur there's going to be so many things that you need to figure out that's what we talked about you know books and everything earlier that's why i try to do a book a week i mean this is more of like a Ty Lopez concept. And I think that's probably where I had originally learned it from and, and got into the whole thing. But like, I'm always trying to learn something and we don't know what's going to happen in 10, 20, 30 years. The only thing that we know is that we're going to have to learn something new. John, welcome to the show, man. How's it going? It's going awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Excited to be on and chat with you. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. We connected over on Instagram. I see you doing some big, big things. You're playing the game of Monopoly, you're buying up land left and right, man. It's amazing. Yes, sir. The the Monopoly Land Edition. I love That's my it. Favorite. I love it, man. And it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, land is... Something that I've definitely always been interested in, but I've never taken the jump and actually got into a deal. Uh, so I can't yeah. wait to learn from you in this podcast why you're buying land, how you're buying land, and, and what those deals look like for you, man. Uh, but for the people that don't know who you are, John, uh, can you just give us a quick breakdown of what sure. you're currently doing, man? Sure. So you pretty much nailed it. I mean, I buy and sell land. It's pretty much that simple. Um, I'm not a realtor or a broker or anything like that. I'm just an independent investor. So literally I go out and target a piece. I buy it. I become the owner and then I sell it. Um, at its core, it's that simple. There's obviously a lot more that goes into it and just, you know, with marketing, advertising, branding stuff, I do kind of taking it to a whole nother level. Uh, you know, so that's my business. It's Jazz Land. That's the official name of the business. Kind of plays off my last name. So Jazz, J-A-Z, Land. Um, you know, I used to be an engineer. I like to travel. I quit that job to run this business full time and kind of just travel around. Uh, huge sports fitness guy. So unfortunately, with this whole coronavirus thing, that's getting kicked in the butt right now. But the business is still going strong. So hanging in there, running the business and uh, just doing my thing. I love it, my man. We got a lot to talk about, bro, because, yeah. you know, petroleum engineer, man, that, to me, that's like, like, mastery level stuff that I probably would open up a book and be like, what in the <laughs> hell am I reading, man? So how did you become a petroleum engineer, and, and why did you get into that field? Yeah, so... I mean, you kind of, you kind of right as far as like, that's almost like everyone like, oh, I'm a petroleum engineer. I'm an engineer. Like I'm big time. I made it. So it, it's, it was a good job. I mean, I'm, I'm from Michigan. Um, I've always been just very adventurous and motivated. And I kind of felt, uh, followed the traditional path as far as, you know, go to school, uh, get a good job. Uh, I, I can't really say specifically why I chose petroleum engineering. It's a very high paying job. I was attracted to it because um, you can work anywhere in the world. Like I was always interested in like the drilling rigs and like all this huge equipment, highly technical. Like I can go work in Africa. I can go work in Southeast Asia or anywhere just about across the United States that they're drilling for oil and gas. And I just thought it was so cool. And I really wanted to go out of state uh, for school. So I'm from Texas. I went to Texas Tech. I, I went off to Texas for school because obviously that's where uh, like the majority of the oil field is and kind of big time is in Texas. So I wanted to come down here for school. So it kind of just all came together. Good paying job, a lot of flexibility where to work, some really cool stuff. Um, I was going to go out of state for school, uh, just a four year degree that's high paying. And uh, I was always good at math and science. So I was like, you know, this probably fits. And I, I just really leaped into it. And luckily, you know, most people have issues with choosing their major and changing a bunch of times, whatever. Like I never really felt myself double guessing what I chose to do. I mean, it really just fit pretty good. And yeah, I mean, it just, I did it in four years and it ended up being a good platform to leap from. It was a good job. Mm. 
So how did you perform in school, man? Were you a A student? Yeah. Did school so, come easy for you? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, not to brag, but I mean, school did come pretty easy for me. And I, I was, I can't even, it's been so long and I don't hardly care about the piece of paper anymore nowadays. So I can't even remember my exact GPA, but it was 3.95 ish or something. Um, yeah. And it was just never really a problem for me. I, maybe it's because I enjoyed it and was kind of just like a math nerd growing up. But yeah, man, I mean, it was we never opposites, bro. We opposites, yeah. man. <laughs> math is my enemy. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not always fun, but it, it's hey. something that you need to know, especially as an engineer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, I, I definitely agree with you there, man. So was, was going to school. Cause you mentioned that you, you took like the traditional route. I can definitely yeah. relate to that. Was that something that your, your parents like pushed on to you or was it like your friends? Like how did it become the traditional route for you? Were you encouraged yeah. to go to college and do well in school or? Yeah. Did, did you go to school by the way? Did you go to college? I, I dropped out of uh, community okay. college. Yeah. It wasn't for well, me, man. Yeah. That's not for everyone. And I, I guess I never really even thought about if it was right for me or not, because like you said, my parents, uh, mainly my dad, like that was his goal for me. No one in my family had graduated from, from college. And so I, you know, it was like, you're going to go to college, you're going to get a degree and a good paying job. And that was both my parents, especially my, my dad was like, that was their, their dream almost, or, you know, like their goal, like to push me to do that. And I had no problem with it because uh, the second part of that is all my friends were going to school, you know, everyone was going to school. You graduate high school at this time. I wasn't, uh, I was always like entrepreneurial spirited, like flipping stuff, like concert tickets and stuff like that. Um, garage sale on odds and ends, but I didn't study any of these big time guys like Gary V or Grant Cardone or Ty Lopez. Like none of these guys were even really around back then as far as I knew. And none of this stuff was available to us with social media. So everyone was going to school. Everyone was, you know, going for whatever they're going for a degree. My parents wanted me to go and it was kind of just, okay, well, you know, this is what I'm doing. And right. I was all for it. I mean, I was going to go on this adventure to Texas and become an engineer. I mean, I didn't think twice. The big argument is like, you know, do you go to school? Do you not go to school? You know, yeah. I think, man, school teaches discipline. Like, it, it's not always a bad thing, right? School teaches discipline. And plus, when you're younger, I mean, going, being able to go to your school and meet people, like, that's one thing I wish I, I actually went away to school because I could have probably made a lot of friends that, I'd still be friends with today and got to experience like that college lifestyle. I didn't have that, you know? So yeah. I don't, I don't knock people that go to school, man. I don't, you know, as long as yeah. you're not and complaining about it. Yeah. I don't knock people who go to school or don't go to school. I mean, I've really, uh, I really think it's individualized and you know, for you, it wasn't your thing for me at the time. It was my thing. So who's to say? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. So you got into petroleum engineer. Now, when you came out of, out of school, did they already link you up with a job or did you have to start like applying? Like, what did that look like? Yeah. So it's very much like <laughs> a system uh, with petroleum engineering where they have uh, job fairs when you're in school, you get internships and when you're in, you know, sophomore, junior year, and then hopefully when you come out, you have a job. So I interned with the company. Um, I had a great summer with them my junior year and they offered me a job before my senior year even started. So I accepted that. I went into senior year of college knowing that, you know, I had this job lined up and when I graduated, uh, I was going to go to work for him. So as long as I didn't do anything too crazy, my senior year of college, I was pretty much set with the job right out of school. Awesome, man. Awesome. So how long did you end up doing that? The engineering? Yeah, so it was uh, three, a little over three years, just about three years um, working in multiple different places. It started in Houston in the energy corridor area as we were talking about a little bit before this, and then um, ended up moving out to West Texas and Midland, which is like the promised land of oil and gas. That's yeah. what I like to call it. Yeah. yeah. What, what do you think about Houston, man, when you were out there? Uh, I, I was indifferent. I mean, I didn't love the city, but I didn't hate it. I mean, it, it wouldn't be my choice of places to live, but, I mean, it, there's a, plenty of stuff to do. It's a big city, so yeah. just like any other city. Did you, uh, did you ever get down to, like, Memorial Park or like the Houston Zoo area, Montrose. Like, did you experience the city at all, or kind of just I, worked? I didn't, I didn't get a full city experience, honestly. I mean, 
I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a big city guy myself. So I don't particularly enjoy like the, the bar or pub scene or night scene or, you know, exploring the city. I mean, I, I like the museums and stuff like that. Uh, I've been to some of that stuff in Houston and some of the parks and stuff, but yeah. not a huge big city guy. So did I get the full city experience? Probably not, but yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Houston's a concrete jungle, man. It's either you love it or yeah. you hate it, bro. The way I tell people is that Houston's just a making money city. That's it. Like, you know, I like that. Yeah. you can definitely, you know, build a family there and whatnot. But when it comes to tourism, Houston's not the place. Um, you know, it, it's like it's just a, a everyone's on a hustle in Houston. They got freeways yep. like the Jetsons. I mean, it's it's crazy. They freaking speed out there. That's oh yeah, sure. oh yeah, man. <laughs> oh yeah. But you know, um, for people uh, you know that enjoy food, Houston definitely has a lot of restaurants and. You know, I mean, it's, you know, it's it's not a bad spot, man. But that's cool that you were out there for a little bit. And then you went out west. And eventually, my man, you got into buying some real estate. You got into buying yeah. land. So what did that look like? So you're a petroleum engineer. You go to school for four years. You're working hard. You're getting great grades. You get a position. You're doing what you wanted to do. But then you changed everything and got into buying land. So what, what happened? Yeah, so... I, I tell this story sometimes, but it's actually something that is very specific that happened. So you come out of school, I'm working at this job. They send you on rotations. There's different disciplines of petroleum engineering. So my first rotation, I'm doing uh, reservoir engineering and business development, working crazy hours, slaving away at the office. It was cool stuff. Like I was super into it um, and doing good work. And then bonus season comes around and they give you performance based on what you're doing how you're doing and they give you, you know, your bonus check, which for a patrol engineer is depending on the company, you know, 25, 30, $50,000 just depends. So I go in for my bonus review and it's a one through five tiered system. And my manager sits me down he talks with me and, you know, tells me how he's never seen anybody like me within six months doing what I'm doing, picking it up, blah, blah, blah. Uh, learning so fast everything and he gives me a four a four out of five he's like this is unheard of like you know to get a four out of five and i'm like well if i'm doing that good why didn't i get a five out of five why am i getting a four out of five i put in all this extra effort to get a four and then i start thinking well why was i working this hard even if i i had got a three out of five like the difference between a three and a four bonus wise was maybe like three 3,000 bucks. I'm like, so I literally put in all this extra effort, all this extra time, the grinding away, didn't particularly enjoy going to the office, waking up super early every day, staying late hours to get a four out of five and earn like an extra two, 3,000 bucks on my bonus for the year. And so that just really kind of set me off as like, I am literally becoming like what I like to call a corporate slug. Like I'm going to work mm -hmm. every single day, slaving away uh, for this small increase in pay and to help this company as a public company um, create value for their shareholders. But, you know, I'm getting paid well, so should I really be complaining? I, I don't know. I've just always wanted more. So at that point, I just got completely frustrated. I started listening to all kinds of podcasts, reading books. My first book that I read that was like non-school related is Choose Yourself by James Altucher. It's probably my favorite book of all time. Pick that sucker up, read through that. Um, this would be uh, late 2015, like shortly after I got hired on, six months or so. And uh, it really just changed my life. Like I read that book, I started thinking like there is so much more to just doing this, going into the office slaving away to get a four out of five and it just really pissed me off at that point my entrepreneurial journey kind of really began and i started doing all kinds of stuff trading stocks like i was pretty much a full-time stock trader at one point i was trying to design different products uh all kinds of different stuff and one day i was just listening to a podcast uh while driving to um, a work site actually in south texas and some dude was talking about land uh, the land business, buying and selling land, um, how to do it, what type of money you can make, blah, blah, blah. And I just, at that point, it just really piqued my interest because of the passive income potential of real estate and land in particular. So I just started studying it. 
uh, bought a couple courses on it and I ended up just leaping and jumping straight in and buying my first deal, my first piece of land. So luckily for me, I had the money being an engineer. So I had some decent startup capital and didn't really have to worry about just making the leap and diving head first. But so long story short, it just, it was just a whole cooped up frustration from the whole experience. My first six months or so working in the real world, so to speak. And, uh, it just pushed me to just try and discover something else. And it was just by happenstance that I was listening to a podcast and found this land business and kind of fell in love with it. I love it, man. A um, lot to digest there. I want to yeah. touch on a few points, man. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, I, I've met many entrepreneurs along the way uh, that come from the corporate world or come from doing something that they thought they always wanted to do. And then something happens, right? It's like that one you know, snap of the fingers, something clicks and suddenly they don't want to do it anymore because they don't feel like they're really getting paid what they're worth or they don't feel like they're building something of their own, right? It's like you're, well, are you just a name on a piece of paper or are you really, really, you know, being valued for what you're worth? Would the company replace you tomorrow kind of thing? But it's almost like that one thing happens, right? That click and then, you know, you can completely do a 180 and and switch up and go on a completely different path. And, uh, you know, like you said, that happened. You happened to be listening to that podcast and they they said, hey, you know, buying land is is the play, yada, yada, yada. You started putting in some time and you ended up getting into your first deal. Uh, Tell us about that deal. Well, I guess first is to touch on your there. I think everyone has that moment and it's very individual that snap and it's either from a built up like frustration or energy or maybe a event that happens to you. And I can just say from experience and for any kind of newbie entrepreneurs or someone who's looking to start their own thing. I mean, you need to have that motivation in my opinion. Like for me, I was just so motivated by all this stuff going on. Like I wanted to escape that world of working in the office. And, you know, I was listening to hours and hours of podcasts a week, reading a ton of books. And it was like, finally I discovered the land thing, but it's like you, that motivation I had, I can't even explain. Like I haven't, I'm not sure I've even experienced anything since like, personally motivation wise since then i mean it was just a whole nother level so i find this first deal i was just kind of scrolling on the internet there's land websites just like your realtors and zillow.com i mean lands of america and land watch are like your two land websites so i'm scrolling through looking at pieces in west texas and i see this piece that just looks like it's underpriced for 53 acres out in west texas and i'm like this is 8,500 bucks for 53 acres. So it's like 160 an acre or something. And I was a little bit familiar with the area just from research I had done. I was like, you know, I think this could be a good deal. It's 53 acres. It's five separate 10 acre lots pretty much. So it's already subdivided a little bit. I can go in, I can scoop it up for cash and then just subdivide it out and sell each lot individually for you know a hundred bucks a month for 36 months or something like that and get it cash flowing 500 bucks a month or so and i mean that's exactly what i did and 8500 bucks is not a little amount of money i mean that's a pretty solid chunk of change and <laughs> wait wait, wait. john I, i'm so sorry to interrupt you but did you say you bought 53 acres for 8500 bucks yeah, yeah. So I don't think you can. Find that. You can't find that anywhere. You there. thought that was a good deal, bro. That sounds like an insane deal. Fifty-three yeah, so acres. Holy cow! Yeah, there's parts of Texas where you can find stuff, believe it or not, for under a hundred bucks an acre um, if you look hard enough. So. And this is just raw, I, just raw land. Uh, yeah, just raw land. Are we talking about like, I mean, West Texas? So is it more like desert area land? It's yep, not so like it's desert. not like the woods, right? It's not like a forest, forest no, land. I mean, <laughs> yeah. We don't have many trees out here in West Texas, so just like little desert brush, mesquite overgrowth, um, yeah. pretty flat land. Yeah. Uh, you know, no restrictions. You just go out there and you can pretty much do whatever you want. Wow, man! So when you when you saw that deal, 
and you came up with the idea, which I'm sure you learned through one of those podcasts or audio books, YouTube videos, whatever, yep. that you can actually subdivide the land and lease it out to somebody else for cash flow or sell yes. it, like maybe owner finance or something like that. Mm-hmm. What were you thinking like this is going to be prime for residential or this is going to be commercial being that there's no deed restrictions like how did you know what somebody would want to put there yeah so at this point i had already studied two programs land academy and um land geek which are two kind of pretty popular land programs so i was kind of familiar with the whole thing before making my first purchase and uh it it comes down to one of my three things i look for in land is just usage so i started to think of kind of just with the end in mind like okay we got this desert scrub raw land what is somebody going to be using this for it's going to be get away from the city go out shoot hunt maybe bring an rv or camp out there kind of just get away from the hustle and bustle of the city and so at this point i was like you know like i said i was already familiar with owner financing which you had mentioned you know selling off a piece of land just on a contract or depending on the state what type of paperwork you need hundred bucks a month for 36 months times five, you know, so for each 10 acre lot, you're talking 500 a month for 36 months, 18 grand with the initial investment of 8,500. I mean, that's still to date, probably one of my worst deals that I've done my first one. Um, and it was, you know, it was easy to sell because you get down to a hundred bucks a month, just about anyone could afford it. Uh, it's simple use. A lot of people are looking to go out there and do that type of stuff. So it's easy, pretty easy to market. And I was just off and rolling that first deal. Uh, it went quick. I was surprised at how quick it went, how smooth it went. And I just, from there, started buying more and more pieces like that. And it was just off and running. So who actually ended up buying the the um, acres from you? So it ended up being five different 10.6 acre lots. So five different people. It was a few people out in the uh, the El Paso area looking to get away from El Paso and then a, a couple people up in the uh, like Midland, Odessa, Lubbock area closer to the Panhandle more in the heart of West Texas and it ended up being um, three pieces I financed out and two I got cash on so it was like three of them for a hundred a month for 36 months one of them I sold for like 2,500 bucks on a quick flip. And the other one I sold for 4,500 bucks after I had realized that I sold the other stuff way too cheap. So I was like, okay, this stuff's going way too cheap. I need to up my price on the last piece that I sold for 4,500 cash. So ideally it would have been 500 a month cash flowing, but you know, it's kind of that mix and match between do you want owner financing or cash deals? You need a little bit of both to keep your capital and make your business work. Right. So for the hundred dollars a month for thirty six months, that was an owner finance. Is is that right? Yeah, just yeah. an owner finance, a simple contract for deed out here in Texas. Did you did you take any sort of down payment down uh, from the buyer? Yeah, I, I like to do simple down payments. So we just did a hundred down, hundred a month for thirty six months. Because the lower down payment you get, the more buyers who can afford it, right? So if you start bumping your down payment up to a thousand, two thousand, five thousand, right. I mean, less people can afford. What type of um, what type of pre qualification process do you do with your buyers at that price point? Yeah, that's at that price point. I don't do any like official qualification process. I don't do any official qualification process on any of my stuff. But what I do is kind of just get a gauge for the person for the customer, right? I mean, you don't want to have to fire a customer. You don't want someone crazy paying you, constantly hitting you up, uh, creating problems. Um, you know, doing stupid stuff. So it's like, you can pre-qualify people, you can check the credit and all that type of stuff. I don't do any of that stuff. But what I do is just kind of spend a little time, talk to them, get to know them, you know, what do they do? How do they make their money? Why are they trying to buy the land? What are they going to use it for? And kind of, you can get a feel for someone really quick if they're going to be a good payer or just create a whole bunch of problems for you and a headache down the road. Right, right, right. Wow, man. Um, that's a really interesting strategy. I actually never even uh, took a look at, you know, subdividing huge lots into individual lots and then leasing them out to people and getting cash flow on it. So 8500 bucks, you ended up turning it into eighteen five. you said, total? Was yeah, that right? it was 18, yeah, it was eighteen five ish total after all the cash and financing deals were done and everything. Um yeah. To date, it's still one of my worst deals 
which is funny. But hey, <laughs> it's the first one, man. Dude, my first deal, I made like seven grand on, bro. And it was a, it was a house that I fixed and flipped. So sometimes, man, I mean, the first deal is not the best, right? Yeah, that's a not a lot of money for a fix and flip, is it? No. Well, I so I did a 50-50 partnership on it. Okay, yeah. But my cut was seven grand. And uh, yeah. it was my first ever deal, you know? Yeah. Back then, I mean, I was 24 years old at the time. I thought I just hit the hit the lotto, man. I was like, man, I got it's the biggest check I ever had in my life. Now looking back, I'm like, oh man, you know. Yeah, for that, sure. That you was learn peanuts. <laughs> yeah, you you learn by putting in the work and sweat and tears sometimes. So sometimes the money not not always the main value, but the experience is. That's it, man. That's the see. That's the most important part right there, and I love that you just said that because that's the golden nugget. Even if you end up losing money on your first deal. I promise you that you're going to learn more by actually doing it and being a practitioner. And you're going to be able to use what you learn to go out and do a, a hundred of those deals that are not yeah. going to be losers because you, you jumped over that first hurdle. And I'm sure you can relate to this, man. You know, just watching other people that want to get into the game of entrepreneurship and business. Too many people are afraid to take that first step forward. That first leap, right? And you weren't. I, I wasn't. But there's a lot of people that are. What would you tell that person that's like they're on the fence? They're like, ah, I don't, I'm scared. You know, I'm afraid of failing. Yeah, well, it is a tricky concept because for me, fortunately, I had that capital to start and wasn't really worried about it. I would say each person is different. Each person has their different tolerance of risk. They need to find something that is within the risk tolerance and do it. I mean, you're not going to learn anything by not doing it. So don't go into this expecting or any business expecting, you know, to buy a $50,000 piece of land right away, especially if you're only making 50,000 a year. I mean, it's not practical, no matter what business, find a little bit, uh, find a little something that is within your risk tolerance and do it that way that you can get that experience from doing it. Um, and failure is going to be part of the game. I mean, there's deals that I've failed on and I am would c consider myself super experienced now. And there's still stuff that just doesn't go right. So there's going to be stuff that does not go right. That's for sure. That's mm. what life is. But you need to find something within your risk tolerance and do it. So that way you can start building that experience and learning what it is that you like, what it is you enjoy, you know, try different things. What do you what do you kind of find yourself gravitating towards and just do it within your risk? I mean, there's plenty of stuff out there that is small, manageable, you know, it's not going to break the bank. It's not going to cause a lot of time or heartache or, you know, anything like that. So find something within the risk tolerance and just go for it. Boom. Great advice, man. You know, down in Houston, there's an area in the loop called West University and Bel Air. I'm sure yep. maybe you've heard of those areas. And they're they're uh, really prominent areas. I mean, you see a house seeing houses over there, three, four, five, six million dollars. I have a few friends that are builders, they do spec builds, and they're buying these ten thousand square foot lots for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right? Yeah. Uh <laughs> which is which is crazy because, you know, back when they were first acquired by the by the original homeowner, I mean, they were probably paying, you know, a few thousand bucks for the land. And now it's like, holy smokes, right? Thousand X or more on, on these, uh, these returns for the original buyers. So do you, do you take that in consideration when you buy land? It's like, if I buy this today, maybe in a hundred years from now, like my kids, kids will have this and it'll become like the next shopping plaza or something and be worth millions. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, do you, do you ever think about that when you buy deals or, or no? I don't because the stuff I do is so short term and I'm doing deals and there's always going to be another deal, right? So I'm not trying to speculate. It's kind of just the same reason why I don't invest and hold stocks or have a 401k for the long term. I mean, I'm not here to speculate what the stock market is going to do in 20, 30, 40 years. I could be dead by then. The world could have had five deadlier pandemics than the coronavirus and it could be everything is up in flames and going crazy. So it's like, 
I like to think what is the demand now? What is it going to be in, you know, the next couple months? Is something drastic going to change here very soon? Um, you know, I'm not trying to speculate out 10, 20, 50 years in the future because, you know, who the heck knows? There's way too many deals to be had in the meantime, I think, for us to be doing that. So you're, you're, so you're, you're a short-term player in the game. You're looking to get in, make your money, cash flow, and get out and on to that next yeah. deal. Yeah, and I mean, I guess the, the only thing I ever have to worry about is like the longest note I do on these owner financing is 10 years. So I guess if you're doing five, 10 year notes, you need to be aware of, okay, in 10 years, is this city gonna completely evaporate because of X, Y, or Z? Um, even 10 years is not that long. Um, it's getting up there. So that's why I don't like to do anything beyond 10 years because at that point it's like, it's just getting to be a little bit too long. Um, so mainly it's just finding the next deal and getting it cash flowing quickly. Or if you're doing cash flips, sell yeah. quickly and, you know, have your money accelerate and, you know, money loves speed. So the quicker you can make it happen, uh, the Boom. more you're bro. That's another gold nugget right there. My man, John, bringing yeah. the heat. Money loves speed. I love it. So I'm curious, John, the, the 53 acres on your first deal, what are the taxes like on a, on a, on a lot like that? Yeah, so I think the tax on that one was probably two hundred, maybe two fifty a year, the entire thing. That's it. Yeah, that's pretty. It's pretty low. I mean, holy uh, smokes! You'd, you'd be surprised at what some of this stuff, even stuff kind of closer to the city, like whether it's closer to Houston, kind of in the rural areas, maybe an hour, two hour away. I mean, the it's not being appraised that high, so your taxes on that vacant land mm. are usually Oh, and there's usually some exemptions for agriculture or, you know, stuff like that. It's not until you get in there and actually start building or improving it that your taxes are going to start increasing through the roof. Wow, man. So you can buy land and just hold it, pay 250 a month, you know, or 250 a year, excuse me. A year, yeah. um, so it's not much of a burden if you if somebody goes out there and finds a deal tomorrow and they buy it, but they don't even know what they want to do with it yet. They can just hold it. And not like be bleeding out from tax expenses and things like that, pretty much. Yeah. Awesome. No, absolutely. You'd yeah, be surprised. Cool. There's a lot of Texas landowners actually that are from out of state, surprisingly, in all areas of Texas. And that's exactly what they do. They buy it as an investment or maybe they want to move down there someday. They don't know. And, you know, they just get that small rural tax bill and they pay it. And that's the only thing that they're they're paying every year. Wow, man. So I'm curious with the, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions because I'm so intrigued by this, man, because this is, I think this is so cool. So with the land, right? What happens if there's oil on your property? Do you own the mineral rights and the oil and all that good stuff when you buy that deal? Yeah. So I actually just did a video about this. It's funny you ask. Um, Texas the mineral rights are separate from the surface. We call it the surface and the mineral estate, right? So they're two separate things. There is a little loophole in Texas where the surface owner can own 50% of the minerals, but that's only on certain pieces of land. It's called mineral classified land. And outside of that, your surface and minerals are separate. So just because you go in and buy a piece of land does not mean you own the minerals. And in most cases, you have zero chance of owning the minerals because these old timers back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, when they started striking oil back in the day in Texas were smart enough. When they sold the land, they reserved it. So they sold the surface and they said, I'm keeping the minerals because oil is crazy in Texas. People are poking holes in the ground and it's spewing up in the air back in those days. So it's two separate things. Really? Wow. So who, who would own it in that case? you'd have to do a title search and go back and figure out who owned it, who reserved it um, in a deed back no in the day. No shit. Yeah. So, okay. So you buy it, you buy a 53 acre lot and then you find out that there's oil on your land, but you can't touch it because after you doing research, you find out that I own the oil that's on your, under your dirt basically. Yeah. So Whoa. I wouldn't, any benefit from that an oil company could come in and drill it and um they'd be paying you 
the revenue from the oil now being the surface owner if they want to come drill on my surface they have to pay me damages and i had a lot like that uh two years ago i had just a little 15 acre lot the oil company came in and drilled on it and after they got done drilling running pipelines etc they ended up paying me well over a hundred grand it was probably closer to 125 um for that and the land itself was probably worth 30,000 so by the time they got done destroying it and paying me for pipelines and all this different stuff I mean it ended up being way more than the land itself was worth really interesting stuff man I gotta I gotta keep doing some doing some research on uh, how that all works with the mineral rights I still can't believe yeah. you know, it's similar in New York in New York City a lot of people don't know this, but there's like air rights as well. So uh, yeah. because they build vertically in New York City, the the air above your building is actually real estate. So yep. I mean, it's it, it, it's 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 crazy stuff, man. Crazy stuff. Uh, you know, I, not too long ago, I was looking on Zillow. Funny enough, that we're having this conversation, and I was looking at land in New Hampshire, and I was blown away at how cheap you can actually buy land in New Hampshire and Vermont and the north northeast states. And mm-hmm. you can buy like, you know, I'm sure you've taken a look already all over the country, but I mean, you can buy like 10, 15, 20 acres for, you know, just a few thousand bucks. But yep. those areas like in New Hampshire, for example, are like in the mountains, right? They're in the woods, they're in the middle of nowhere. So I'm thinking to myself, well, okay, mobile home. Yeah, you could probably, you know, get away with that. But if you wanted to build a house there, I mean, there's no plumbing, there's no, you know, electric, electric setup or anything like that. So can you even do, use that land to do something if it's in like the middle of the mountains or like what, what what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, for sure. So you pretty much hit it right on the head. I mean, you kind of just got to have it in the back of your mind. Okay, this is not going to be for a permanent residence. But that area of the country has so many people, so many big cities. I guarantee that there is going to be a ton of people who want to just own a piece of land that they can go out in the woods maybe shoot some guns, tear it up on a four by four, uh, slap a mobile or some type of just little cabin or tiny home on. I mean, there is so much opportunity everywhere in the country in land. And my favorite spots to look are just exactly what you're describing right there outside of your major cities, an hour or two hours. uh, People just people. What I found is people want to just own something that is theirs. A piece of land fits that perfectly, especially right now we're facing this whole coronavirus thing. People want security, right? They want to own something that is theirs, that they can say is theirs, that they have on their balance sheet, that they have in their back pocket. Uh, I have this piece of land that I can go out to and do whatever it is. In most cases, if it has no restrictions, do whatever it is that I want to do on it. Mm. Gotcha, man. So, being that you're a land buyer and this is what you've become a master at, have you ever taken a look at other asset classes? Yeah, for sure. I actually own a rental home nice. <laughs> um, in, in Midland, Texas, and it's still sitting there vacant and needs uh, some minor improvements on it. And I, I was out there just a couple days ago and I was just freaking kicking myself. Like, why did I buy this? I mean, I, I want to learn more about rental homes. That, it's something I want to be experienced in. So that's why I went ahead and purchased it. But it's just like, I don't know, man. I'm not sure it's for me. It's still sitting there vacant for well, what, what is it? What does it need done? Uh, the foundation is kind of, so the floor is like kind of dipping in places. Okay. Um, it, it needs, uh, is it on slab or is it on blocks? Uh, it's on blocks. Okay. It's, I haven't personally looked at it yet under there and seen what's under there, but it needs some foundation work like that. It needs, what else does it need? The floor. I mean, I guess it doesn't technically need a floor, but I'm guessing because of that foundation issue, there's some tiles on in the living room and kind of the hallway. So like all the grout is just like chipped up and uh, the tiles are kind of loose. You're walking on and it's like kind of crackling. So just stupid stuff like that. The doors are crap. It's like, I, I'm did, not did, a house. Did, did, did you buy it cash or did you take a loan for it? What'd you do? Uh, a loan. Okay. And it, it was a good deal. I mean, I know it's going to cash flow, but it's like, I just can't bring myself to like learn about houses and like get someone out there to help me out and find a rental and fix it up. It's like, it's just, 
it's like accounting for me. It's just such dude, a pain point. <laughs> literally, dude, one of the best things you can do, John, is just find a GC in that area and just have them handle it, man. Don't 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 drive yourself crazy trying to sub yeah. out all the work yourself because you're just you'll go nuts, man. Yeah, if I, I mean that would be my recommendation. Just hire a GC that does turnkey rentals and just tell them, hey, I want this thing cash flowing by next month. Just get it done and uh you know, don't break my bank kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, dude, rentals, rentals can be a great way of making income, but I personally believe that with rentals, you have to operate at scale to make any serious dough, serious money, yeah. because, you know, one or two rentals, you're probably not going to have enough available cash flow to a four property management. I mean, at that point you, you might, you know, but depending on the deal, but it becomes more of like a tenants and toilets kind of headache kind of deal. Um, so it's like, if you, if you, if you want to be in the rental business, this is for all listeners out there, think about, okay, how can I go from one property to multiple properties as fast as possible? So I can have a portfolio, you know, and not just okay. dealing with one house. I had a rental last year. I sold it, drove me absolutely batshit crazy, batshit crazy. No matter where I was in the world, John, this tenant, great guy, but he'd figure out a way to call me. He figured out a way to tell me that the sink is clogged and and the, there's a bird's nest in the in the, in the uh, chimney. And I'm like, oh. I had to tell him one day. I'm like, hey, like I just want to make sure we're clear on this because I don't think you know. But are you aware of how much a handyman actually costs for me to send somebody out there for these very minuscule things? And I told him straight up. I'm like, listen, you've been living at this house for a few years now. Like, yeah. can't you handle, can't, can't you unclog the sink? Like, do I really have to send somebody out there and pay them a couple hundred bucks to unclog the sink? And he started to reason with me more and more, but it's important to have that conversation, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I've, I've heard, this is what I heard about rentals everywhere from that story to stories of having good renters who actually will make improvements on the house and handle all that stuff yourself themselves. So it's like, I guess, I mean, oh, having yeah. a good rent. Yeah, I, I, Absolutely. Totally agree. Totally agree, man. But, you know, cash flow is king, right? Cash yep. flow is king. So you, you're doing some other asset classes. I like it, man. Um, and you're obviously very active in doing what you're doing now, which is buying land. So I'm curious. Walk us through what the average day is like for you, John, when you're not in this quarantine situation. Like you're out and about. You're in the field. You're hustling full time. What What is your average day like? Um, well, I like to, I like to get up at a reasonable time. I mean, I'm not someone who gets up at four or five in the morning. I mean, that's one thing I hated about my old job is having to wake up then. So, you know, seven o'clock or so wake up. I like to read, read in the morning for 30 minutes or so, get myself going, have a little bit of something healthy to eat. And then I'm usually looking at emails or notifications for my land business. Like, okay, is there any customer that needs help? Is anyone hitting me up looking to buy land? Any emails from services or third parties I work with? Do I need to get them info or anything like that? Usually I'm spending like an hour or so doing that, just kind of putting out fires, uh, getting anybody information they need. I'm a big fitness guy. Unfortunately, the gyms are closed down, so I, I like to work out late morning, early afternoon. I, I see later. the traps, bro. I see yeah, that yeah. Um, for the for the yeah. audio listeners, you got to get on YouTube and, and, and watch. My man's ripped up. I love it. <laughs> they're shrinking a little bit with the lack of gyms here. Um, but yeah, so early in the afternoon or late morning, early afternoon, I'll try and get a workout in uh, when I still have energy. And then kind of mid afternoon, it's like, you know, doing anything. Do I need to do anything more business related, like make contracts, uh, get people documents that they need, uh, answer more questions, a, a lot of phone calls. I like to pick up the phone. Uh, that's one way that I think anyone can grow their business, especially land quickly is just pick up the phone and call people. So whether it's counties or realtors, brokers, you know, probably four or five times a day, I'm just having, you know, simple five, 10 minute phone calls with people, uh, talking with them, customers, mm -hmm. realtors, brokers, um, you know, so, and so now we're in the late afternoon and it's like, I'm, I'm kind of just hanging out then unless I have anything else business related I want to do, you know, mm. travel, 
hang out with friends, whatever. I mean, I'm, I kind of like a flexible routine. I'm not a huge, like strict routine type of guy because stuff is always changing. I think as long as you're kind of up at the same time and, uh, right when you wake up, I think is probably the most quick critical point. So that's why I like to read, feed myself with good information, learn something new, try to read 30 minutes to an hour a day. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably a solid, solid day for me. I mean, sometimes it's more busy and a lot of times it's less busy. I mean, doing land, it's pretty simple and straightforward. I mean, there's plenty of days where I'm just traveling or I'm just road tripping or I'm just hanging out with friends or doing whatever. And I, I don't even open an email. Mm. So you know how to disconnect as well and just enjoy yeah. yourself. And, you know, st- talking about reading, man, it's on my desk. I'm actually, I'm about to dive into this one. Have you checked this one out yet? I have not. I've never even heard of that one, but I'm going to write it down here. Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. It says, Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. Here, how a few companies make it and why the rest don't. It comes very, very highly recommended. Okay. Yeah, man, I'm about to start it. Dude, I just finished this one for like the 10th time. This one is bad to the bone. Have you read this no, one yet? Yeah. No, but I've heard of it. Yeah, I think I plugged this book like a hundred times a month because it is just so good, man. MJ DeMarco, Millionaire Fast Lane. How much how much do you read? Like are you do you have like I want to read a book a week or a book a month or a book a day, like a Ty Lopez? Like what are you trying to do? I'll be honest with you, man. i am I'm not that good at um sticking to a reading schedule. I'm not. Okay. Um the reason why I put the books in front of me is so I remember to say, hey. Read it, read it. Like I even challenge myself. I'm just going to read five pages today and I'll yep. kind of like force myself. And then I'll, I usually, I'll just keep going once I start, but it's like, for me, I'm more of like an action, action, action. Like I need to make money now kind of thing. So I need to work, work, yep. work. But then I remember, of course I need to feed my mind. You know, it's one of the most important things you can do. So I need to see it. And yeah, I'm a visual learner. Fall. Yeah. Uh, What's easy that? To fall in the- of wanting to be action, you know, try and do little things, whether it's little things, big things, try and get stuff done. I mean, sometimes, I mean, that's the most important thing to do is be a learning machine, in my opinion. And it's freaking sad. I think that a statistic is like the average American doesn't even read one book a year or mm-hmm. something like that. Um, True that. I, mean, I try to do a book a week and it's like, I got a few books on my table as well sitting here and it's, just a discipline thing right like you were saying i mean just hopping in there reading five ten pages a day if you can i mean reading definitely teaches you discipline it's not something that just comes easy it's something that you kind of need to build up and build that focus to to do it it's like it's a practice for sure i I agree 100 percent. in fact for me i've been using this strategy for the last couple of months where instead of reading as much as i can i find one principle a day that resonates with me that sticks out. So I find myself cracking a book and I'll just scroll to a random page and I'll read that page and I'll try okay. to take one principle. So yesterday, for example, um, I was re I was reading this article or excerpt and it was talking about how, you know, when you see a Lamborghini or a Ferrari, how the speedometer usually says like 180 miles an hour, 200 miles an hour. But most people who own those cars have never taken it to that speed. They've never driven 180 miles an hour. So there's a, there's a difference between what you're doing and what the actual potential is. And it relates it to the entrepreneur. Just because, you know, what you're doing right now might seem really, you know, powerful to you and good and you're, you're hustling, you're doing it. Are you hitting that full potential? Probably not, Right. So I try to find that one, that one nugget of the day. And that's a good, yeah. I like, yeah, man. So, um, John, you've been dropping some, some serious bombs here on the show, man. And I can literally talk to you for hours upon hours about land and real estate and all that good stuff. But I know that throughout your life, I'm just going to put this out there. I could be completely wrong, but I, I have a feeling just like any entrepreneur, You've had your fair share of challenges, obstacles, curveballs, because it's not all unicorns and rainbows. Entrepreneurship is like, it's like a roller coaster, man. So 
you know, what are what is one challenge that you've had to go through that really just, you know, stays on your mind, stays on your memory? It was probably here recently. It would have been uh, mid-2018. Um, it was just super crazy. I mean, I'm trying to build my business. I had quit my job, so taking that leap to quit my job and go full time into my business. At the same time, I was getting out of a really long term relationship. So I had that on my mind. Um, my grandpa was sick with cancer. Uh, it was just kind of everything hit at once. And it was, it, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, it set me back into 2019. Um, 2020, I've been crushing it and it's been amazing. But 2019, especially the beginning half, was just kind of, I felt like I was spinning my tires, right? Just kind of trying to stay afloat. And I think for me personally, it's been less about business challenges. I'm not sure I've had a challenge with my business yet. Thank God, like as far as like, am I going to make it or something drastic went wrong? But it's more, I think everyone can relate to this. It's more like your personal life and how it affects your business or how it affects your work. Maybe you're going into the office, maybe you're an engineer or an accountant, and it's, you know, your family life or your relationships or a best friend or something is giving you a hard time and how it affects your business or your work life. And for me, that really hit in mid 2018. And uh, I never dealt with anything like that before, personally. I mean, for me, it was always just simple, go to school, do what I had to do, do my work, whatever it was I was doing. And so that was the first time anything like that really hit me. And if I had one regret, it was just, it, it took me a long time to get through that and just kind of, I don't know what it was. It was just a, a learning experience. And I always pride myself on being very emotionally stable and I'm not really an emotional guy, so to speak, typically. And it's just, that really kind of did affect me. And I don't, I mean, I don't know how or looking back on it, I mean, just if I could have handled it diff differently or what I could have done, but it was something that took me probably a solid six to 10 months to, to work through. Mm. And it's just, I think everyone has those moments and you got to just keep your, your head above your shoulders and do what you need to do. And really, I think really if you focus on yourself and, and just learning something new every day, taking the next step forward, focus on just personal growth. I mean, that's what helped me get through that. Mm. I love it, man. Yeah. Though, those, uh, those down moments when it rains, it pours, you know, yep. anxiety, depression, it's just a part of being human, my man. You know, that's, yeah. I think we all been through it and, uh, it'll happen again. Right. I mean, that's just life. The cycles, Fourth, but I like what yeah. you said, man, it's how you reacted to it. Because you probably shortened it, honestly. You know, long-term uh, relationship or whatever, bad breakups, family health issues. I mean, that could, that stuff can go on and affect you for for quite some time, you know. So six to ten yep. months, man. I'm sure feeding your mind and staying busy and staying productive definitely helped you, uh, you know, come out of that. Come out of that, you know, swinging. I would think so, yeah. Man, so um, I want to switch gears here. A little bit and talk about what you're going to be doing in the future. I know you said you're more of a spontaneous guy. You don't really do stuff for the long term per se. But if you were to just snap your fingers and we're like 10 years in the future, where do you see yourself? What kind of goals do you have for yourself going forward? So right now, what I'm really focused on is growing um, my personal brand. So it's something that I've been kind of lacking and not doing i've been just you know doing land deals and stuff kind of behind the scenes and not doing any things like this like podcasts or instagram or youtube anything like that so that's my huge push right now is to kind of just grow my following and be able to help as many people as possible and to get more attention um to myself i mean i'm not gonna sit here and say that i'm the most altruistic person and i'm gonna you know help everyone selflessly and everything like that. I mean, I don't think that that is the right way to go about life personally. I mean, personally, I'm like 70, 30, 60, 40, maybe like 70% selfish, like 30% help other people. But at the same time, what motivates me the most is having that respect and 
being the master of land, for instance. In order to do that, I need to help other people. And I enjoy helping other people. Self selfishly, like helping other people makes me feel good. It also gets me more respect, more attention, and helps me grow my brand. So the more people I can help, uh, the bigger I'm gonna grow. So snap my finger in 10, 10 years, I've helped dozens, if not hundreds of people buy and sell a piece of land, um, become inspired to do something that they haven't done before, kind of break free of the corporate slavery that we, I talked about earlier. And I've grown my brand on all social media. And who knows, by then TikTok's here now, by then it might be another social media. I mean, we have no idea. So that's really where I'm at right now is kind of trying to, outside of my business, grow more personally and gain more attention for what I'm doing and help as many other people along the way. And I've already done that with my friends. I mean, my buddy, he just, uh, he bought three separate pieces of land uh, two days ago, and yesterday he already sold one. He bought one. He bought them for six thousand, three of them, so two thousand each, and it's an estimated twenty-three thousand worth of notes or so. So he's almost gonna quadruple his money after he gets them all sold, I and mean, he's already sold one in a day. So the others are, you know, probably gonna go qu uh, go quickly. So it's it's helping other people like that spend a little bit of their money not in the stock market or all this other BS, but in real estate in specific land and help them grow um, both financially and personally. That's mm. kind of my goal for Boom. the future. I love it, man. You know, you, you're wearing something on your wrist for the YouTube viewers. They see yeah. for the audio. We, we, don't be a little bitch. The wristband. <laughs> don't be a little bitch. This is Uncle G. Grant Cardone. Mm. He's a... Uh, be my second favorite behind Ty. I'm a big Ty Lopez person, believe it or not. I'm in his uh, in his mastermind group, and um, I've met him personally a couple times. I've I've DM'd him back and forth on Instagram and stuff like that. And but Grant, I go to 10x every year. I got this wristband. It would have been at 10x2 in Vegas. It says 10x and don't be a little bitch, which is one of Grant's favorite mm -hmm. sayings. Yeah. So oh yeah. Find myself not to be a little bit. I love it, man. <laughs> I love it, dude. Yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. I I went to 10x one, the the first one in Miami. Miami, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Were you at that one? That's the only one I haven't been to. That was the one I went to. Uh, Les Brown was there. Russell Brunson. Yep. Uh, Andy Frisella. I think it was the get... smallest one he did. So you know, out of all of yeah. them, like it just kept getting bigger and bigger. You got to get to the more re the the new ones, man. I do, I do, I definitely do. Twenty twenty one, I'll be there. I'll be there. Okay. I'll see you there, man. We'll chop it you up. You will. I wonder I if it's my... gonna be. Is it in Vegas again, or is it back in Miami? Their plans to have it in Vegas again. I already bought my ticket. Um, I want to be sitting front row. I was three rows away from the stage uh, this last year in Vegas, so I. I upgraded to even the next level, and I'm like, I'm already hitting them up. I'm like, I need to be front row. So there's nowhere else to go. Like, I was third row. Yeah. The only place I could to the front row. And then after that, the only place I could go is on stage. So I don't know what I'm yeah. going to do about that. Oh, so you must have went to all the uh, the VIP parties. Uh, yeah. Did you see Snoop Dogg this, this last couple of months the, in February? Yeah. Snoop and Rick Ross. Snoop was one night. Rick Ross was the other night. He had a... With Rick Ross, he had his hangar rented out, and he had his jet parked in there, and he had a stage. Yeah, I saw the videos. I thought, yeah. I thought it was hilarious. Uh, Snoop Dogg's blowing a blunt in Grant's face and backstage. Always, always. <laughs> I'm like, Snoop doesn't change for shit, man. Uh, it's hilarious. Oh, man. Yeah, Grant, definitely a huge inspiration. Ty, love Ty, love Gary Vee, all the influencers uh, that are making noise, and Dude, I think you're going to be up there, my man. I can't wait to see what's next for you. Uh, you know, you, you're definitely bringing a lot of value, and I believe you stay consistent, man, with the content. You'll definitely be up there, brother. Uh, you got okay. a great message to share, man, and uh, a lot of uh, golden nuggets. So I appreciate you for being here. I ask every guest the same question, and I want to extend that question to you if you're up for it, man. Um. I ask that you just take a second or two to really think about the answer. You up for it? Yeah. Awesome, man. In your entire life so far, John, what has been the absolute best advice that you've ever received? Mm. 
that's really that's a really tough question it's obviously really hard to choose that one little piece um i think i think it's got to be that you need to be a learning machine um along with that ties into obviously you need to have goals you need to be willing to learn everything but you need to be a learning machine if you it doesn't matter what you want to do if you're working somewhere in an office or you know whatever it is in order to advance in your career you're going to need to learn new things if you want to be an entrepreneur there's going to be so many things that you need to figure out that's what we talked about you know books and everything earlier that's why i try to do a book a week i mean this is more of like a Ty Lopez concept. And I think that's probably where I had originally learned it from and, and got into the whole thing. But like, I'm always trying to learn something and we don't know what's going to happen in 10, 20, 30 years. The only thing that we know is that we're going to have to learn something new. We're going to have to adapt. We're gonna have to reinvent ourselves. So that stuff is always going to be required reinventing and adaption. And the only way you're going to be able to do that is to be a learning machine and scoop up and, digest as much information as quickly as possible powerful man powerful john a lot of listeners they're gonna want to hit you up man they're, they're gonna want to connect and follow your journey what's the best place for them to do that uh probably ig just john jasniak j-o-n-j-a-s-n-i-a-k um my website's jazzland i mean uh hit me up on ig or any social media platform it's all just john jasniak first last name I answer all DMs, all emails, whatever. So. Awesome. Yeah, and we'll link that yeah. in the show notes. And with that being said, John, I want to thank you so much for being a guest here on the Start of Summer podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure to chop it up with you for the last hour. And uh, again, man, can't wait to uh, see what's next for you, and we'll stay connected, brother. All right. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate right. you having me, man. Take care, man. All right.